I won't talk to you about it. Because I think the men might get a bit fed up. <clears throat> you might want to turn back to Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I want to look at those verses that uh, we read. <coughs> the, the little um, in joke with the Sanctus about verse 19 it was because yesterday we were looking at a different chapter of Ephesians and it, we were laughing about verse 19 and the fact that we couldn't remember what verse we were on. Anyway, verse 19 this morning is a significant verse, but we'll get to it in a minute. Because this morning, if you've not realised, we've been celebrating and praising our great God. A God who is able, how much time have we sung it? What is he able to do? More than we can ever ask or imagine. Now, do you believe that this morning? That's the first question. Do you really believe that God is able to do more than we can ever ask or imagine? Good, because scripture reminds us that God is able to do that. We serve almighty God, don't we? A God of creation and of recreation. The God who holds the universe and everything in it in his hands. The God who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the almighty, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-loving, gracious God. Are you getting the picture of how big, how wonderful our God is? And I am absolutely overwhelmed and awestruck that our great God, this all-powerful being, as the songsters have just reminded us, loves us and cares about us and is interested in near me. And you. Doesn't that do your heart good this morning? Mm. And when we stop to consider this incredible fact, <coughs> maybe we should all want to do as Paul does in our scripture this morning. In verse 14 he says, I kneel before the Father. I kneel before the Father. I wonder when the last time was that you knelt before Father God. We don't do that a lot nowadays, do we? Yeah, we pray, but sometimes we don't fall on our knees before the Father. But Paul was falling on his knees not only to pray, but he falls on his knees out of a deep sense of reverence and awe that he was coming before this great God. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and Paul is recognising the sheer greatness of our God. But what is Paul praying for? Well, look at verse 16. He's praying for the Christians in Ephesus to be strengthened and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't easy for those first Christians, many of whom were being persecuted. So Paul here is wanting to remind them and encourage them about the glorious riches that were available to them to strengthen them and help them in their daily living. Hey, we live in a society, in a world 
where the Christian gospel is often ridiculed and mocked, where there's opposition to the Christian faith. We live in a society where many people no longer go to church. They don't know even what Christianity is all about. And we who come to church need to be sure of our faith. We need to be sure that we know what we believe in so that we might be effective in our witness as we go back out here after the end of this meeting. We might feel weak. We might wonder how God could ever use us. But I want to remind you all that the same <coughs> glorious riches of God's power and strength which Paul writes about him, are available to you and me today. And maybe we need to fall on our knees and ask God for the grace and the strength to do his will in the world today. Excuse me one second. I note in verse 17 that faith is required. Now faith is a belief in God, believing that God will do what he's promised to do. And linked very closely to faith is trust. We heard a bit about that, as Foxes did anyway, yesterday. Faith is a belief and we need to put our faith into action and that's where trust comes in. Trust isn't a passive word, trust is a very active word and it requires us to do something. I was interested, uh, Mike and I do our own separate prep when we, and he told you the songs as a story about uh, me in the Dead Sea, or maybe not in the Dead Sea. Yeah. And I've noted another little story. <laughs> Still about me. I, I don't tell tales about other people. But um, you might have gathered, I, I've always been um, afraid of water. So I can never swim. And when I was about 40, I thought, this is absolutely stupid. Everybody else can swim like a time. So we were on holiday once and Mike said, come on, I'll help you. Well, you, can, you can do this. So uh, he was very patient with me. He promised not to let me go under. And I, I knew he'd save me, he wouldn't let me drown, but I just couldn't make that step of faith. Because it's all right me saying, yeah, I know I've got faith in you, but I didn't trust, oh, was it myself enough to let go and let the water hold me and help me? Well, did I learn to swim or didn't? That's a story for a night. <laughs> then we come to this wonderful verse 18, which reminds us of the vastness of God's love for us, a love that will never let us down. And uh, You'll note that it refers to all God's holy people, the ones who are rooted and established in love. The Christian family, you and me. It reminds us that God's love is high and deep 
and why. Do you remember learning about that when you went to Sunday school and singing the chorus, Wide, Wide is the Ocean? We've been taught it from being young. And we should believe it, that God's love is so high and so deep and so wide and all-encompassing for you and me. And Paul wanted his readers to grasp this truth of God's great love for them. And I want you too this morning to grasp that same truth, that God loves you, that God cares about you. But it doesn't stop there because he then he uses this little phrase. He wants you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Don't just have the head knowledge. Don't just read it and say, oh yeah, God loves you. He wants you to understand with your head, but to accept with your heart. It's a different thing, isn't it? Yeah? You can read something and know it, but to grasp it in your heart and understand it more deeply and fully is another matter. And God wants you to have that 18 inch drop. Because, says verse 90, when it affects your heart, then something amazing happens. You will be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow! That's amazing, isn't it? Well, I think it's amazing. I tell you, wow again. Because the gospel is amazing. Some people would call this the second blessing. Baptised with the Spirit. Sanctification. But Paul says it very simply and very plainly and very clearly. Because when it affects our heart, we are filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. And that blessing's for us all. The end of the prayer, and this verse is so power, powerful, and we've been singing about it. It's the immeasurably more verse. We serve a God that gives us, that does, that can be immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. And that is an amazing truth for us to grasp this morning. We, the people of God, have such a lot to celebrate. We celebrate our immeasurably more God. I'm sure that you could tell me so many wonderful things that God has done for you, in you, through you. But the exciting thing for me this morning is we serve a God that can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine or dream about. We serve a great God. And I think this morning, our response to this great, great God should be the response that Paul had, that we should fall on our knees and say, thank you, God. You are awesome, God. You are great, God. You are almighty, God. Thank you, Lord, for loving me.